I wanted to take a moment to reflect on what Bob Jesse called the arc um, of lineage and of all the people who kind of allow you to be in a certain place at a certain time. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to actually notice when you're standing in the middle of that arc. And I can kind of see all of the past and all of the future branching out from here. And it's, uh, it's amazing to have all of you here and amazing to be working with the people that I am at Hopkins. Um, of course, the acknowledgments extend beyond the Hopkins team. Um, when I arrived in uh, graduate school at UC Davis, uh, we were embarking on this totally crazy project to take a bunch of Westerners and send them into the mountains and have them meditate for three months at a time. And it all kind of happened because we had a family rather than just a group of collaborators or academic people or scientists. And uh, one of the collaborators from that study, a family member, is here, Erica Rosenberg. So it's exciting to see her. And also, the wonderful priestess from my wedding came just for this afternoon. And so, Sarah, thank you so much. So yeah, it's just so many people to thank, but I got I to gotta give you guys a talk, not just a bunch of thank yous. Uh, so what does Buddhist meditation have to teach us about psychedelic science? Um, I'm sure most of you know about Buddhism, at least a little bit. Um, there's the kind of historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. There is the myth, kind of the legend of who he was. And then there's the real kind of cosmic Buddha. Um, the interesting thing about Buddhism is it was just a normal human being who was kind of dissatisfied, even though he had everything he possibly needed to be happy. And he embarked on this quest to find out where true happiness is. And around the age of 29, he kind of left everything that he was familiar with and, um, and was just kind of seeking this enlightenment, this happiness. And it was actually, I think, exactly 2,500 years ago this year that he sat under a tree and said, I'm not going to move until I figure this out. And um, Buddha just means awakened one. And we kind of come from that ancient tradition of mind training, thousands of years old. And the kind of overarching idea of my talk is how do you take an ancient practice and turn it into modern medicine? And I think that Buddhist meditation is a success story in alternative and complementary medicine that it would behoove us to pay attention to. And I think if we want to take the ancient traditions of psychedelic healing and make them into modern medicine and make them mainstream, we have a really good example in contemplative science. And it's happening right now. And it's a big success story. And so that's kind of the, um, the gist of my talk. So meditation comes over to the West um, probably in the late 1800s, um, but definitely in the 1950s and 60s. And it wasn't until the 80s that um, someone kind of came up with this idea of turning meditation into a nice secular term that everyone could get behind, and that's mindfulness. And so we can thank John Kabat-Zinn uh, for kind of coming up with a term that, uh, that Americans could kind of get behind. It wasn't challenging their religion. And mindfulness has now been used in various capacities for treatment of sick people, for pain, mood disorders, addiction. You might be familiar with mindfulness-based stress reduction. There's also relapse prevention. Um, it's also been used to study mental training in healthy people. So kind of looking at optimal functioning, pushing the limits of what we consider to be healthy and well. And it's also been a cornerstone of basic science into neuroplasticity. So how it is that the brain can change in structure and function as an, in, in adulthood. Um, I like this little, um, this little graph down here because it shows that this was a study not related to meditation where people were either physically practicing piano sequences or mentally practicing the sequences in their mind. And it turns out that the brain doesn't care. If you physically practice something or mentally practice something, you get the same change in brain representation of that skill. And that's kind of a lot of how we've talked about contemplative science, uh, trying to explain to people what happens when you're just sitting there, quote, doing nothing. Uh, your brain is actually relearning all sorts of new habits and skills that then can be applied in other contexts. So I'll give you just the example of the experience I had as a grad student working on this project called the Shamada Project. It was kind of the, the, um, the brainchild of Cliff Saren, who is a, an American neuroscientist, and Alan Wallace, who was born in America, traveled to Asia, and then kind of came back. So he was our bridge for, to the Tibetan Buddhist culture. And they kind of had this idea from the first time they traveled to India together that why don't we study normal Americans engaging in intensive meditation training and try to show people whether uh, 
it's not just kind of where you were born, that you were treated like a god from the age of two, or that you were living in a monastery with no concerns, but that normal people who had committed their lives to this very intensive mental training could change in certain ways. So we conducted uh, two three-month retreats. The original study design was something like a year-long retreat, and um, it was probably a good idea that we didn't begin with a year, because <laughs> we're still trying to turn through the data, and that's only from three months of worth of meditation. But 60 brave souls were willing to sign up. Um, actually, more than that, this was about 50% of the people who applied. And they each, uh, each person came to Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado and meditated every day for three months. And some of us lucky scientists got to live there with them. And we were kind of doing the, uh, the marathon science uh, me mental training instead of meditation. OK, so I don't know how many of you are have tried meditation or are familiar with any of these papers, but shamatha meditation is a concentration practice. Um, I think it appeals to our, um, our sense of kind of getting somewhere. So there's a goal of trying to attain perfect concentration. And we begin with the breath, and you focus on the breath. So um, I won't kind of take you guys through this, because you know people don't really, <laughs> I don't know. If you like meditation, then you're like, ooh, yay, we get to meditate. But if you haven't done it before, you just are kind of fidgeting and getting uncomfortable. So Essentially, you're bringing all of your awareness to the sensations of breathing. And then as soon as your mind wanders, you notice that it has wandered and you bring it back. And you just do this over and over and over again. And something really profound happens. The more that you do that, your mind kind of settles down. And maybe before it settles down, it goes through all sorts of other things. But eventually, you kind of get to this level of calm abiding where you have the ability to stay present in the moment and use your attention at will. Uh, so it's really simple, but you have to do it. And I kind of like this little, this little image here. Very simple. You just sit, focus on your breath, and all sorts of amazing things will happen. These are our group of meditators. Um, so people were either assigned to, when, when they signed up for the study, they knew that they would either get assigned to an initial retreat in the, uh, in the winter and spring of 2007, or they would be weightless controls and get assigned to a second retreat in the fall. And so. I mean, as you can imagine, this is a luxurious thing to undertake. You have to have quite a bit of money, about $5,000, although it's cheaper than if people had paid a retreat center to do it on their own. So there's kind of a discount for being in the science, scientific study. Um, but it costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Uh, you had to be willing to give up three months of your life at different points in the year. And still, we managed to get a pretty um, not diverse group, but it's a range of ages, a range of backgrounds, all the way from 22-year-olds who are straight out of college or in the middle of graduate school and taking a break, all the way up to uh, people, some people who've been meditating their whole lives and wanted to just kind of engage in another intensive retreat. This is the lodge where, um, where all the meditators lived and where the scientists lived in the first retreat. I don't know how many of you have been to Shambhala Mountain Center. In, it's outside of uh, Fort Collins in Red Feather Lakes. It's, uh, it's really, really beautiful. This is uh, the stupa on the property. Most of the meditation occurred in the, um, in the lodge that they were staying in, and, um, and they could kind of go around the property. It was, pretty, it was a pretty loose structure. It wasn't like a Vipassana retreat where everyone's kind of doing the same thing every day. Uh, there was kind of a flexibility, and that was, um, that was the teacher Alan Wallace's kind of style. We built labs there so that we could conduct uh, behavioral and neuroscience testing on site so that people didn't have to be disrupted in the middle of their retreat. So yeah, these are our kind of portable laboratories. And I know that looks kind of like a dungeon, <laughs> but um, it was our attempt to create a soundproof and controlled lighting um, environment so that we could basically mimic the really expensive and permanent neuroscience and psychology laboratories that exist at universities. Um, you might also notice there's a camera that's kind of pointing straight at the person as they sit in front of the computer, but that was actually covered up during the testing so that we could unobtrusively measure people's emotional responses to certain stimuli. And um, well, the woman I mentioned earlier, Erica Rosenberg, uh, has created this work of art, which is a 4,000 word beautiful paper that, um, I can't say much about it because it's under review right now, but it's so exciting that um, soon the world is gonna see all of this amazing kind of what happens after three months of basically just paying attention to your breath and sitting to the ability to be with uh, depictions of graphic human suffering in terms of facial expressions of emotion and, and self-report. 
we eventually actually debriefed people. So we had to measure it and not tell them that we were measuring their facial expressions. And then people could um, opt into the data at the end of the study once they were debriefed. And that's us collecting data. So that's kind of where we sat for many hours every day for three months. And we collected also brain measures of electrical activity at the scalp, so EEG. Um, we collected physiology measures. So that's one of our volunteers. That's Stephen Eichley. He's one of the uh, research scientists on the study. We collected blood and saliva, all sorts of different biomarkers. Um, this was, the approach here was we may never get to do something like this ever again, so we're going to collect as much data as possible. Um, and <laughs> that was both a blessing and a curse because now we have more data than we know what to do with. But. So I'll just take you through one example of um, a kind of nice demonstration of how meditation improves your ability to control your mind and your behaviors. Um, we uh, developed this really boring and also frustrating task that involves looking at single lines appearing at the center of the screen, flashing on and off. And most of the lines are long, and you respond when you see a long line, and then sometimes the line is short, and you withhold. And it's very frustrating to do because you kind of get in this mode of continually responding, and then you can't withhold. And people do really badly at this kind of task, especially when it's about half an hour long. And what we found is that after about a month and a half of training, people were able to improve their performance in inhibiting their responses. And it actually translated into how they uh, self-reported that they felt at the end of three months of retreat. And so we kind of used these fancy statistical models to show that the better you did at that computer task, which seems really silly, predicted how good you felt in all these different domains in terms of well-being, mindfulness, empathy, uh, different personality measures, uh, how you feel in terms of interpersonal relationships, anxiety, and um, being able to regulate your emotions. And I think this kind of demonstrates that it's, a nice, um, it's nice to combine very mechanistic tasks with something that's real world. And I'll kind of come back to that later with respect to psychedelic science. OK, so the bottom line is meditation is really good for you. I think everyone should do it. Um, I think it's kind of funny. I just want to take a step back that, you know, with the Hopkins team, we didn't plan this. But we're really kind of like taking you guys to church this afternoon. It's like <laughs> we're like beginning with Bob and religion and kind of reframing religion and Brian and Mary sharing so deeply about our experiences with volunteers. And now I'm trying to tell everyone to practice meditation. But that's just how that's just our style, I guess. Um, so we found improvements in perception, concentration, uh, biomarkers of stress and aging. Uh, changes in brain structure and function. And there are tons of other studies that have looked at changes in uh, the amount of gray and white matter in, um, in people's brains as they go through training. And also brain function. There's just, I mean, it's an exponential growth in papers on meditation training, both in adepts and in beginners, people who are healthy and who are sick. OK, so to sum up kind of what contemplative science is now, um, there are longitudinal studies of healthy people people who are beginning a meditation practice and long-term meditators. And that has allowed us to kind of foray into a much larger field, which is interested in neuroplasticity. Basically, how the brain can change once you're through major development and into adulthood. Uh, we have mindfulness-based therapies for depression, addiction, pain, chronic conditions that involve kind of um, autoimmune disorders. Uh, more recently, there's this kind of movement toward resilience training. So, um, I, I included public schools along with prison and military because I think um, sometimes we forget that public school is really, really, really challenging and suffering for a lot of people. And you know, we see this. We're here. We're in Baltimore, and we see it every day. That um, while we are having people have mystical experiences on a couch, there are people who are in acute suffering right next door. And I think that the what contemplative science has offered is that something. A practice that's really simple, it's free. Once you learn it, you have it. That can be used in all sorts of different contexts. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, giving us a tool into in, uh, actually training meditation practitioners to be scientific tools. So they can report to us about phenomena that normal people may not have access to. And I think that there's a kind of correlate there with psychedelic or psychonauts. So people who actually practice journeying may be better at telling us things about the mind than people who don't. And so we could kind of keep that in mind going forward for basic science in, in psychedelics. And finally, and you'll hear this if, um, if you're going to the dinner tonight, I hope you'll hear kind of more about this idea of wisdom and compassion and altruism that is coming out of the uh, basic and clinical science in, uh, in the realm of meditation. OK, so what does all this have to do with psychedelic science? Um, 
I'm just giving you an example of one of the findings from our, um, from our studies. It's the one I can take credit for because I was there when it happened, and so um, anything that's good or bad about this finding, I, you know, it's kind of all on me, so um, that's why I use it. But um, this is an example of what happens when you do a longitudinal study of healthy people. You can look at how changes in, um, in their functioning over the long term are affected by a particular experience on a psychedelic, in this case psilocybin. Um, and kind of extending that forward, you could imagine all sorts of really interesting research with creativity, openness is related to uh, inspiration, number of inventions and patents that people have. Um, there was an Australian study that showed that one standard deviation increase in openness over time was equivalent to a $60,000 increase in annual income in terms of general happiness. Um, you can imagine all sorts of interesting applications for psychedelic-based therapy, which we've heard a lot about this weekend. Uh, for treatment-resistant major depression, and we have a couple groups in the world now, in the UK and other places, about to embark in this, in this direction, uh, looking at brain mechanisms, neurochemistry, uh, changes in, in the brain in terms of uh, kind of stimulating neuroplasticity. And that all sounds very exciting. However, this is where I'm going to kind of say my piece about how psychedelic science should, should kind of watch out. Um, I actually don't think that there's any amount of data or enthusiasm that is going to be enough unless we reach out to the people who don't think that psychedelic science is such a great idea. And not just psychedelic science, but psychedelic healing. And so I would kind of remind people that, you know, now meditation is mainstream. That's a picture of um, uh, a congressman from Ohio who's big into meditation and mindfulness all of a sudden. He was basically at his wit's end and he started, he went on a John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness-based stress reduction retreat and it changed his life. And so he wrote this book, Mindful Nation, and he passed it out to Congress. And I mean, this is so mainstream, it's, it's almost hard to imagine where meditation came from. And I think in the, it was not an easy sell at first. And uh, you know, I, I kind of came toward the tail end of meditation being accepted. But even when I was in grad school, uh, starting in 2004, um, many of our faculty members and kind of fellow, fellow academics basically thought that meditation was um, was just totally wacky and like why would you waste your time on, on this kind of study and you know I will I you know all the stuff about mystical experience is so powerful at the personal level and in terms of when the person goes back into society but I think we have to be careful because sometimes it sounds really too wacky for people and uh, it sounds unfamiliar it can be scary I mean we are all kind of celebrating this idea of not being uh, tied to a permanent self but most people like the idea of a permanent self. <laughs> and, um, and when you kind of say that, oh, well, this kind of experience can show you that all is one, it's like, no, 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 everything isn't one. It's me and everything else, <laughs> you know? So we uh, kind of keeping in mind that this is the perspective that some people are coming from. And finally, I mean, this is something that is obvious, I think, and unfortunate that because psychedelics are Schedule One, some psychedelics are not Schedule One, but they're all basically illegal for most people to use and illegal is assumed to be dangerous and that's going to take a long time to change that kind of thinking and it's just kind of what we have to deal with so i think going forward we can use contemplative science as a model so we should continue with clinical trials and that's not just i think getting fda approved medications which a lot of people have talked about at this conference a lot of exciting research is going on in that area but it's kind of presenting a new model for healthcare and especially for palliative care um, contemplative science, too, is offering a new model of health and well-being and how to approach various points along the life trajectory, especially in death and dying. And so I think we should kind of keep that in mind, that we, we may not just be suggesting new medicines, we're suggesting a new model. Uh, longitudinal studies in healthy people, I, I don't think we can forget how important basic science is in this whole um, enterprise. Uh, the idea, so the, the, you know, I mean, Obama just um, had this brain initiative, and um, the public loves to see brain images and think about, oh, I can just change my brain. And it's not something that's wrong with me. It's just I need to kind of repattern and rewire and train my brain. And doing studies with healthy people can help to show that, with, especially with psychedelics, as well as contemplative science. And I think we should look at both beginners, so people who are hallucinogen naive, thanks, and adepts. And I'm using the term adept. Um, I mean, this is maybe a little bit sacrilegious depending on your take on Buddhism, but um, you know, we kind of court monks and adepts into the lab and people who've dedicated tens of thousands of hours to sitting with their mind. 
And we don't have that same kind of respect for people who spent tens of thousands, well, hopefully not tens of thousands, but hundreds of hours uh, journeying with psychedelics. And so I think that maybe there's a kind of shift in perspective in how we, um, how we respect the different members of our community who are willing to take these journeys, even if we're not, or especially because that they're illegal, so they're kind of taking a risk. Um, and this is kind of a, a preachy part, but I think that contemplative science has been really successful because the people who um, practice meditation continue to show society how they are helping. And there is a very strong ethic of compassion and service. And um, you know, when you're just kind of sitting with your own mind or journeying on psychedelics, it can seem very self-centered. And I think there's a risk for narcissism and elitism of you know, kind of I know everything and I'm just kind of saving myself. And um, in particular Zen, um, the approach is we sit so that we can be of service. And I think that we can kind of think about that related to the adept idea is that um, we trip so that we can be of service. And the better role model that you are in society, the better this will kind of help the whole psychedelic science movement. This is not a new idea. Um, in 1996, you know, kind of combining psychedelics and contemplative science, Joan Halifax, Ram Dass, uh, other Zen teachers, Jack Kornfield, got together and kind of said, well, you know, are psychedelics a help or a hindrance in contemplative science? And um, Jack Kornfield said, I see psychedelics as one of the most promising areas of modern consciousness research. I would not be surprised if at some point there comes to be a useful marriage between some of these sacred materials and systematic training or practice. So we would do well also to take kind of the training manuals and all of the work that has been done with contemplative science and consider how maybe uh, they've provided a nice platform and psychedelics provide a nice fuel. And we can kind of merge those two together and I think it'll be mutually beneficial. As uh, Brian and Mary talked about if you were here earlier, um, psychedelics are actually really good contemplative tools. So they teach you how to be here now. Um, maybe not without a lot of struggle, but most people kind of get to a point of being in the present moment at some point in their sessions, at least in the, in the sessions that I've seen. And it's basically an awareness and acceptance of the moment-to-moment -moment experience. Um, in different forms of Buddhism, they talk about specific experiences that are enlightening in and of themselves. And if you kind of look at the list here I have from Theravadan Buddhism, we're all familiar with mindfulness and concentration, but then there are kind of all these other ecstatic states that are actually considered prerequisites for enlightenment. And if we can give people an access to that state, then um, we can actually study whether that helps people along the contemplative path. And kind of going back again to the lineage, uh, um, Le Leary and Alpert, who became Ram Dass and Ralph Metzner, uh, put together actually a kind of really nice guide for psychedelic experience. Um, it's not a perfect translation at all of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, but it kind of talks about uh, the connections between psychedelics and contemplative practice. I would also suggest that um, a lot of people, I've learned kind of being with long-term meditators and watching people go through retreat, that you can actually meditate a long time before you learn how to let go and you learn how to uh, accept your inherent impermanence and interconnectedness with the world. And I think that psychedelics can serve as a tool, beginning meditators, middle of the path, even long-term meditators, to kind of test uh, your assumptions about your own practice. Um, and I kind of like, I mean, you can read this quote. This is, this kind of sounds really hardcore, but I mean, some people I've met have had experiences like this, where they come face to face with this fear. And um, anecdotally, speaking to meditation teachers, sometimes people who have experiences with psychedelics are able to uh, be familiar with that kind of um, state in their meditation and move through it. Uh, at, at Johns Hopkins, we are undertaking, we just completed a study of beginning meditators who started a meditation practice and also received psilocybin, and Roland Griffiths will be um, talking about that tomorrow. I'm not sure what he'll say because I've been blind to the study design since 2009 when I joined the team, so I'm actually really excited for his talk tomorrow. Um, we're about to embark on a new research study with uh, psilocybin in long-term meditators. And uh, we have tentatively a session planned for as soon as we get back. Um, these kinds of things take a long time. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how many people appreciate how long it takes to get a psychedelic research trial going. Um, but there's kind of a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy. It's all very necessary at some level. But um, you know, by the time we actually run a volunteer, we've probably been thinking about the study for about two to three years, if not much longer. Um, and Robin Carhart-Harris, um, 
Are you speaking tomorrow, Robin? Yeah, so Robin will be talking about this tomorrow, but there's some really intriguing new findings from last year that seem to actually be continued to replicate, which is that with IV psilocybin, uh, there are decreases in default mode networks that are kind of important for maintaining a sense of self in space and time. And my friend Judd Brewer at Yale had found a very similar pattern of brain activity in long-term meditators when they were meditating versus at rest. And when Robin's paper came out, Judd called me immediately and he said, it looks like the exact same figure from my paper. And Judd's not the first person who's found that there are other papers that have found something similar. And so I, we're kind of thinking about ways to test uh, the overlap and differences between uh, a selfless state on something like psilocybin and, uh, and a selfless state during meditation. Okay, and finally, because I'm just out of time, um, I want to bring us back to this idea of meditation turning into something like mindfulness. The interesting thing is once you give people a hook, you don't actually have to get rid of any of the other stuff. It's just simply a way to make a connection. Uh, so right now, the, the contemplative science field is actually finally moving beyond this idea of, oh, it's just mindfulness training, it's just con concentration training. Um, and we're actually starting to reinvestigate some of the more kind of mystical, um, religious, ethical practices that originally came over with meditation from, from Asia. And so there's also been a lot of debate, you know, did John Kabat-Zinn do a disservice by taking a religious ancient tradition and turning it into something secular? And I don't think so because um, I don't think it would have been possible to as quickly get Americans on board with the idea of sitting with their mind if they didn't have this hook of kind of this secular, very neutral sounding mindfulness term. So I don't know what the hook is for psychedelics. Um, you know, uh, there are limits to the analogy with dreaming, but it works for a lot of people. You know, people who haven't had altered states of consciousness, dreaming is sometimes the only thing that they've had happen to them that is dramatically different than real life. Um, there's a kind of a hook with kind of, you know, a creativity enhancement technique or imagination. I mean, Disney World is one of the most like, successful classic American um, enterprises and it's because Americans love imagination and kind of um, and creativity and 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 entertainment and so that might be a hook. Um, awe and wonder is a little bit more challenging but kind of people I think like the idea of wonder uh, you know being more wild in the wilderness rites of passage you, you know as you kind of go down this list we get to oh wow you just saw dying <laughs> that's scary that's not going to be the hook um, but it might be. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a lot of people in our country, I mean, currently and also very soon, who are in states of not quite out of this life, but not quite in it. So in very serious pain, um, disability, sitting by themselves in hospitals, um, and going through the dying process, and we don't have a way to deal with that in this country. And I think that psychedelics may actually be coming around at just the right time. For, to help our country um, finally come to terms with these transformations, not just at the beginning of life or in the middle of life, but at the end of life. And I, um, I had the uh, honor to sit with Joan Halifax at her retreat center in December, and I was just so amazed by how there are actually allies for our movement in psychedelic science in other fields, in palliative care, um, in midwifery, in um, so many other areas that um, it hasn't even occurred to them. I mean, it occurred to Joan Halifax a while ago. She's no longer a proponent, I think, directly of psychedelic science. Um, she's kind of a supporter in, on the sidelines because she's a Zen priest now. So she's got kind of a, a long tradition to uphold. Um, but there are kind of these allies in all these different areas that we can reach out to. And it's not, I think we need to rem remind ourselves that we are not just teaching people the new model. There are also models out there that we can use in psychedelic science to um, to help kind of people get more familiar with, um, with everything that we're doing and so that they can kind of appreciate some of the enthusiasm and maybe say, well, you know what, I don't want to do this, but um, a family member of mine is really sick and they deserve to die with dignity and with peace. And uh, so I will leave you with that. Thank you so much. Um, we have so much ahead of us and there's a lot of momentum. So, <laughs> yes, thank you.